Content Analysis Overview Content analysis means counting what can be seen. Use counting and categories for basic analysis and insight on speech, text, or screen. Content analysis is a research tool used to determine the presence of certain words or concepts within a text or set of texts. Researchers quantify and analyze the presence, meanings, and relationships of such words and concepts, then make inferences about the messages within the texts, the writers, the audiences, and even the culture and time of which these are present. Texts can be defined broadly as books, interviews, discussions, newspaper articles, speeches, conversation, advertising, theater, informal conversations, or really any occurrence of communicative language. Texts in a single study may also represent a variety of different types of occurrences. To conduct a content analysis on any such text, the text is coded or broken down into manageable categories on a variety of levels. Words, word sentences, phrases, or themes. And then they are examined using one of the content analysis basic methods, which are conceptual analysis or relational analysis. Simply put, it is the study of recorded human communications. There are several important key terms associated with the research methodology of content analysis. Unobtrusive research is research that is done without collecting data directly from people. The data is collected from multiple sources without interacting with people. Conceptual analysis is the analyzing of the existence and frequency of concepts in human communication using text messages, Twitter, radio, email, and many other communication sources. Relation analysis is the analyzing of relationships between concepts and human communication. Sampling is a task that needs to be done by the research team before the data is collected. Sampling is the act of determining how much and what types of data to collect and the time frame in which it needs to be collected. There are two types of content that can be analyzed in the content analysis research methodology. The first is manifest content. Manifest content is observable, tangible content. You are able to see, hear, or watch this type of content. The other is latent content. Latent content is the underlying meaning of the manifest content. Universe is a term that is used to describe the whole of the content. Where you would use the word population for people, you would use the word universe for content. A coding scheme is a classification system used by the research team to sort and organize the samples of data. When conducting a content analysis, there are five different types of sample units. Physical units occupy observable space in print or audiovisual media, such as commercials or comic strips. Syntactical units are units of language, such as words or sentences. For example, the names of political candidates in print media. Referential units are a person or an event, such as a specific character, or the act of watching cartoons. Propositional units are structures such as stories or dramas, and thematic units are broad topics within a structure, such as relationships. For example, a son's relationship with his father in a comic strip shown over and over again. For the history of content analysis, um, prior to the 1940s, a lot of it was done either manually or by slow mainframe computers in which human decoders would analyze the data through different punch cards, which obviously was very time consuming and a lot of human errors were occurring just because a lot of it was done manually. and. So from there, they had a lot, a lot of errors in what they were doing. So through that, um, because it was being used a lot, by the mid-1950s, researchers were looking more towards looking at the whole content rather than just single words that were maybe mentioned throughout 
a study or an article or whatever it may be that they may be analyzing. So it was more of the content rather than the words that they were looking at. Today, both, both options are still used, but more focus on the whole content rather than single words just because it is very time consuming and they look more at the relationships uh, between what is what is in the content and how that affects society and so social, cultural, historical, and linguistic and cognitive significance. So popular uses of content analysis is um, any piece of writing or current or recorded communication, whether this be anything with media or productions or interviews that happen. It's used in many different fields of study, which will be discussed later. Uh, it detects international differences that may occur because, uh, because maybe what is being analyzed will affect a different culture rather than um, per se and per se a different one. It detects propaganda and really what's what's out there and how it is affecting others. The it really identifies the main focus of communication, which is uh, through content analysis, is more of the verbal or visual way that they're trying to communicate a certain message to an audience. And of course, the behavioral and attitude responses with that and how it affects whoever it's directed towards and just really their attitude towards it and their behaviors maybe in response to it. It also detects psychological or an emotional state of groups or person. Again, just kind of seeing their response from the study and really how is it affecting them personally. The common theoretical frameworks that are used for content analysis are linguistic and cognitive science. For linguistic, it's more of analyzing the language that's being used within whatever unit or section of the study and how that really maybe is it a repetition of words that are used to really affect someone or are there certain words that are being used that can affect the certain audience that it's directed towards. And then with the cognitive science, there's the, this is the decision maps, which is uh, comparing and really seeing the representation of relationships between ideas and attitudes and what's really available to the author to make a decision within the text and to how they present that. These are usually, these relationships are usually represented as logical, inferential, um, casual, sequential, and, math and mathematical. And usually there, this is a comparison between at least two, two different things in a single study. With the mental models, they're looking at it numerically and graphically. So this is a specific approach that looks at both of them rather than just one piece there's two different pieces that are being looked at. The fields of influence are the different fields in which content analysis is most likely used. Uh, is first starting out with the most obvious marketing and media, and this is really looking at the verbal or visual print that print or media that's really being communicated to audiences and how that affects them. Of course, there's literature and rhetoric and how that affects others and reading that. Ethnography and cultural studies, sociological and political science. And again, kind of just looking at that social aspect of how does this is this form of communication affecting others, and of course the psychological, psychologically and cognitive science. Here are just a few examples of some questions that you might see with content analysis, and these examples are maybe used more towards uh, verbal print or visual media that is that is being used also known as advertising for example uh, some of the questions are what products or services are being advertised who are these commercials directed towards the the audience that they're directed towards is directed more towards an older crowd, like a senior crowd, or is it directed more towards a child and drawing a child into whatever it's being advertised or, or shown? What is the main theme? 
of an article that's being read or the main idea, what's the point that they're trying to really get across, and how much space is devoted to advertising, meaning in per se a magazine, how much of that magazine is just advertisement for a certain thing, or maybe it's within a whole whole program, how much of that is actually being used for a certain type of advertising to really influence the audience. The audience will need to break themselves into six groups. Each group will be reading and discussing an award-winning children's book. As you are reading, focus on the messages and themes presented in each story. Group 1 will be reading Where the Wild Things Are, Group 2 will be reading The Giving Tree, Group 3 will be reading Inch by Inch, Group 4 will be reading Snowy Day, Group 5 will be reading Kitten's First Full Moon, and Group 6 will be reading Stella Luna. After you have finished reading and discussing in your small groups, we will come back together as a whole group so you can share your findings, and together we will discuss the following discussion questions. Preparing teachers to provide literacy instruction to all students. Faculty experiences and perceptions written by Copeland, Keith, Calhoun, and Wendy. Although there is an increased focus on reading instruction in schools, little is known about how teachers of students with extensive support needs are prepared to provide literacy instruction for this group of students. This paper reports the results of an exploratory study of how literacy instruction is addressed within teacher education programs at institutions of higher education that prepare pre-service and in-service teachers to work with students with extensive support needs. The researchers conducted telephone interviews with nine teacher educators in university programs across the country to prepare special educators, asking about their experiences and perceptions of what works well and what presents difficulty in preparing teachers to effectively teach literacy skills to students with significant disabilities. What additional research and practice knowledge is needed in this area? and how they view literacy instruction for students with extensive support needs, fitting into the current national debate of reading instruction methodology. Content analysis of the respondents' interviews yielded three broad themes that are discussed later on in this presentation. They do cover challenges, changes, and future directions for this field. The researchers then explored the implications of the study's findings for teacher preparation programs and the direction for future research. They examined transcripts independently and developed broad thematic categories based on the themes emerging from the careful readings of the participants' responses. Participants' responses were clustered under these thematic categories and new categories developed as warranted from examining the participants' responses. The authors continued this process until each transcript had been analyzed. Next, they went to discuss and compare their separate analysis. Differences of opinion with respect to thematic category definitions or placement of the responses within themes were negotiated until a final consensus was reached. This is identified as one of the limitations to content analysis, coding errors, because different people might code differently. All of the faculty participants had unique experiences and perceptions on providing appropriate preparation for candidates who teach literacy to students with extensive support needs. They were able to identify commonalities across the interview responses that start to provide a window into this important area of teacher preparation. Three broad thematic areas emerged from the analysis of the interview transcripts. A. Challenges B. Changes and C. Future directions. Each of these areas was in turn compressed 
to a number of sub-themes. 